All right, Philippians chapter 4. I've got a lot to cover here because I have to wrap up Philippians 4. But I hate to wrap it up. There's so much gold here. Um, I preached a sermon just on all the precious promises in Philippians 4. Uh, if any of you are interested, the sermon is titled, uh, My Life Changed When I Met Mr. Glad. So that's very life-changing to me, and I hope it will be life-changing to you. All right, because we have a lot, let me go through this quickly, but I want to carefully ponder on each verse as well. Let's look at Philippians chapter 4, and then verse 11 and verse 12. Verse 11, verse 12. So I explained to you, verse 11, that uh, you have to learn the most covetous gift is not to get more. That's not the most covetous thing in life, is to get all that you want. That's the worst thing in your life. The most covetous gift is that you're happy with what you have now, and you stay there. That's one of the most covetous things, which means that no matter what you go through in life, you'll still be happy, whether good or bad. Amen. So that's a covetous thing that you'd want. Uh, look at Psalms chapter 23. Keep your hand at Philippians 4, because we're always going to go back here. Go to Psalms 23. Now, remember, the reason why you can be content and be happy with what you have is because you've got the Lord. It's that simple. Amen. Once you have the Lord, then everything in life is contentment. Because no matter what path you take, God Almighty will always take care of you. And whether it's bad paths, good paths, the road may be rough and steep, or it may be soft and great, but God will always take care of you. And that's the reason why you don't need anything more in life. Because what is extra plus God? It's only God. How can you put an extra with that one? Why do you need that so much? So that's why in this passage right here, it's so important that Paul says, not that I respect of want, right? Meaning that there's something that he lacks, so want is another term for lack, but I see it as something very interesting play on words with today, where it also can point out right here, we always have a want or desire, right? I want this, I want that. But Paul says, I don't re speak in respect of want at Philippians 4, for I've learned whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. Based on what? God cares for you. Psalms 23, verse 1. Famous passage. The Lord is my shepherd. See, he cares for his sheep. Take care of it, right? Feeds the sheep. I shall not what? Want. So you're not going to want. All right, let's go to Philippians 4 again. Philippians chapter 4, verse 12. Now, this is one of the helping passages with contentment. And another great promise to memorize is verse 12 which teaches happiness. I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. So Paul says there's something I know, both, right? So there are two things that he knows. Abased, being brought low, abound, going up. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed. So everywhere he goes and in all kinds of stuff and things that he has, he learned, he was taught. So usually... With contentment here, because verse 12 is a companion passage with 11. With contentment, it comes from learning. Usually, people who are not content are little children. Why? They always have a desire. They always have it. So because they have it, uh, they always want something more. But until you start working as a grown adult and work things for yourself... You do, learn, you do learn to lay off that bad habit of gimme, 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 right? You actually kind of learn more about contentment, thankful for what you have. And in the Bay Area, if you actually have a one-bedroom apartment yourself and you're paying less than two grand, you're actually content and happy. Amen. And the Texans might think that's crazy, but yeah, that's how bad the place is over here, all right? <clears throat> so... It comes what? From that kind of learning. You learn something. Why? It was so hard to find yourself a one-bedroom apartment. Right, right. 
And it was very hard. You went through even Craigslist. And through Craigslist, so you got these scammers over there trying to say, make sure you bring a check with you or something like that. I got that many times. It's a miracle uh, how I'm able to find the place that I live and the church. And yeah, I ha had to go through scammers. <laughs> so I've learned that myself. So I'm very grateful for with, with what I have. Amen. Even though we're strangers, pilgrimers, literally wanderers right now, right? Uh, I am very grateful still what I have. And I think this church has learned, learned that too, right? We went through so much. It's, uh, and I'll be honest, uh, it was hard times, but it's definitely precious memories. Uh, never forget where we came from. Amen. When God blesses us more and we get more settled, never forget where we came from. Amen. It's that camaraderie. Uh, remember, when we get more settled and comfortable, that's when we can fall apart yeah. again. Yeah. That's what the devil always uses. Sometimes I would always joke, you know, maybe we should uh, just rip up the contract or anything, you know. <laughs> <clears throat> but the point is that contentment comes through learning. So experience is so to important. Look what Paul experienced when he learned. The last part of verse 12, both. Okay, so there are two things that follow, to be full and to be hungry. He learned what it was like to be hungry. He learned what it was like to be filled before, both to abound and to suffer need. He knew what it was like to suffer need, like I need this, but I don't get it. But he also learned that he abounded. Look at Romans 5. Now, this is another verse that should be highly recommended and memorized, Romans 5. One of the best verses concerning about suffering and trial. A lot of times we don't like suffering, but actually suffering is good. You might say, why? Notice that Philippians 4, he suffered need. Through suffering need. Now look at this arrow. It just walks step by step, right? So what happens, it's like a cycle. It com the only way you can learn is that you go through suffering. Paul says, suffer need. That's why he learned contentment. That's why some of you learn contentment. Like, you don't have a rich mansion, but you are content with some of the meals that you're eating and the place that you're living, the job that you have and stuff like that. Why? Because you learned what it was like to suffer yeah. worse. Yeah. Amen. Amen. And not only that, you did learn what it was like to experience better. But then it didn't really get to you. I don't know about you, but sometimes when I experience some uh, life, like sometimes me... Me and my family and my wife, we would uh, go to once in a while, you know, a nice place to stay, right? A comfortable bed, comfortable hotel, which is way better than the place you're living sometimes, right? Yeah. And then you get that once in a while, but then, you know, sometimes it's like, it's not something that I want every day, you know, or like, I don't need to live here every day. It's like just one of those things I go through. Uh, one time I looked at uh, one of my family members, extremely rich and wealthy, and spent like about a million dollars just for flight and experience vacations and all that. And then when I looked at all the slideshow and we were all amazed, instead, my heart was actually more grieved for my family member's soul, my rich family member's soul. I'm like, man, this is so vain. So I actually wasn't like coveting. I was actually more in pity for the rich person, mm -hmm. that the rich person didn't have something that I got. So that's something that you'll learn through uh, experience. Suffering is another building block. All comes down to experience. Experience is so important. That's why suffering is so important. You know why you need to suffer? So you can experience it. And when you experience it, what happens is, look at the building block here. That's why Romans 5 is so important. Look at this, verse 3. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also. Why is that? Knowing that tribulation worketh, notice the first thing. First thing is what? Patience. Okay, everyone hates that. Okay, some of you always give a prayer request, right? Like, I'm suffering this, going through this problem, and you want God to relieve you of that, right? And guess what? I don't profess to be all spiritual. I want that too. And I pray for that too. So it's not like contentment, you know, and you don't act hyper spiritual. I just go through this for Jesus. It's all normal. No, don't pretend you're that spiritual. All right. You're not that spiritual. You know, you're just like me. Oh, pray for me. Going through a hard time, you know. 
we're, we're all flesh. Why? It's normal. It's called patience. We're gritting our teeth through the pain. It's not like a stage of contentment and happiness and peace, right? It's gritting our teeth in pain, patience. But that patience is so important. Why? Because your body and mind is using its energy on that. Experience comes from what your mind and your body it, uh, processed and felt and energized itself with. That's how experience comes into play, because it remembers the feeling, it remembers what it went through, and the thoughts that it went through. And what happens is the body goes through so much that it gets used to it. Why? Because it experienced after through so much patience with it. Does this make any sense? Look at, look at the next part, verse 4, and patience experience, right? And experience what? Hope. Hope. That's why you can hit, Paul gives us hope at Philippians 4 when you go back there. He's giving us a hopeful promise. What, uh, whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. And he's giving that assurance. Why? Because I went through all these experiences, what it was like to suffer and what it was like to increase. And that's what you guys have too. Now, what are you hearing right now tonight? Hope. Amen. That's what you're hearing tonight is a lot of hope. And that comes through what? Through what I experienced. And from what I experienced was because of what so many times I grip my teeth in pain. And that I can only grip my teeth in pain because unless God gives that suffering, which is why Paul says in Romans 5, 3, we glory in tribulation. All right, let's go back. Isn't Philippians 4 such a great uh, passage to just teach hours on? Literally hours on. <clears throat> Verse 13, I can do all things through Christ, which straighteneth me. Okay, another great promise to take time in. All right, a famous passage a lot of you have heard before. I can do all things. So you can do all things. Anything and everything in life, you can do it, says Oprah Winfrey, if you drop through Christ, right? So you have to put through Christ... So we can do everything and anything. That's the encouragement. But when we go, I can, we have to do it through Christ. That's right. important. Right. Now, Joel Osteen, you know what his problem is? His problem is, is with his book, it's uh, I and that's it. Or I can and that's it. That's one of his most famous books. And that's why Oprah Winfrey can ask him. But if he titled it, I Can Through Christ, Oprah Winfrey would never ask Joel Osteen for an interview. You know why she can ask Joel Osteen? Because she has her God, some new age, weird, whatever it is. She probably does Mother Gaia worship for all I care. All right. So uh, Oprah Winfrey has her own version of God. She doesn't believe Jesus is the only way to heaven. It's, you can easily type that on Google and then you'll see her plain statement on that. Uh, and that's why Joel Osteen isn't it very interesting in a CNN interview. He couldn't say Jesus is the only way to heaven. Right. But then because he had enough backlash from the Christian community, why? Because the majority of Christians at least have that one in mind. And that's where most of his cash comes from. So that's why he had to relent on his second interview after that and give an apology. Why apologize? I ain't going to apologize. All right, you want me to make a play? I ain't going to mess up in CNN. You know what I'm going to say? Jesus is the only way. I can through Christ. Okay, very simple, okay? Yeah, and I don't need your money either. Okay, so you notice right here that this is the encouraging part. But then the New Age world, it's I can, I. When you do that, then you're demon-possessed. Okay? Now, I'm not saying every single person is demon-possessed, but pr practically it pretty much is. You follow the mindset of your daddy. And I'm not talking about God, your father. Go to Isaiah 14. Isaiah 14. The mindset of I can is evil. That's why we preach hard against it. Yes. Oh, why are you Christians against positive preaching and, you know, something that benefits you or me, me, I, 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 because it's demonic. But the Bible says that Jesus Christ, I can do all things through Christ. That's your problem. We're only positive when it comes through God's will. But when things are of your own or outside of God's will, it's a nay 
and it's sin, and it's worldly, and it's flesh, and you're selfish. Mm -hmm. All right, that don't sound popular, does it? Look at Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12. Art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? What's his problem? Verse 13, for thou hast said in thine heart, he read Joel Osteen's book. I'll tell you what he says. I will ascend into heaven. Isn't that something Joel Osteen would say? Like, I am going to heaven. I can do this. I can do that. And he had the people chant that in the Oprah Winfrey interview. I am a conqueror. I am a winner. I am a... That's demonic. That's extremely demonic. Why? Because where is God in the picture? And I mean the Lord Jesus Christ the only way, not just an abstract God like Oprah Winfrey would allow Joel Osteen to chant that. <clears throat> I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. See, I am a champion right there. Discover the champion in you. That's Lucifer's song, favorite music. I mean, look at that. Isn't he a champion right here at verse 13? Lucifer, I want to exalt above the stars of God, a champion. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the cloud. I will be like the Most High. That's what Oprah Winfrey was thinking when she said, I can't, and then put God in the picture. I'm going to be like God because I got God in me. That, that new age mentality. See? You know what God says, verse 15? It's from hell. That's from hell. All right, you know where Joel Osteen's book should go to? Hell. All right, let's go back to Philippians 4. <laughs> Philippians chapter 4, all right? I'm not, uh, onliners can get very sensitive. I'm not saying Joel Osteen should go to hell and burn in there, and I want him to. I'm saying that his book should. Yeah. It should go, it belongs to hell. It should not come up here and deceive you onliners. Yeah. All right, yeah. let's go to Philippians chapter 4. Verse 13. Now, this is extremely important. Modern Bible versions, they're going to go, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now, the thing is this, is that it is true that the Lord Jesus Christ gives us strength, and we can preach sermons off of that, right? The only way we can do anything in life, right? All things. Now, did you see that? All things. What if God's will is not in it? Well, guess what? You still can do all things, and I'm going to show you how. This will encourage you. You ready for this? This is a wonderful promise of God. But before I explain this wonderful promise, let me explain the misconception. Misconception is, is that Christ who in the modern Bible? But the Word of God says which in the King James Bible. Right. Why is that? Because it's beyond that. It's true, Christ is the one that gives us strength, and that's the only way where, where we can receive power to do anything in life. So if you base it off of self, then you're going to fall short. Only Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. But then it's, it's more than that. It's inclusive of this. Christ, that gives, who gives us the strength. But it includes right here. The reason why it says which is because it's referring right here the whole part, not just Christ. It's referring to the whole part, I can do all things through Christ. That's the part that strengthens you. All right, it's not just Christ alone right here. It's I can do all things through Christ. All that part based on Jesus Christ alone that gives you the strength, right? But through all those things where he gives you the strength and then you've done and uh, had the ability to do those things, those things strengthen you. You might say, how so? Uh, pretty easy. Go to the book of 2 Corinthians 12. Here's a wonderful promise. Go to Romans 8 and 2 Corinthians 12. Romans 8 and 2 Corinthians 12. You're just ruining a wonderful, deeper promise that the Lord's trying to show you here. Go to Romans chapter 8 and 2 Corinthians 12. Let's learn from the Apostle Paul right here. The idea is anything, whether we go through the good or bad, right? Whether we go through the good or bad, and sometimes we try to do our best for the Lord, this is your mindset, right? You believe this promise, but what scares you from believing this promise is that, okay, this is my first time preaching a message. I can do all things through Christ 
which strengthened me. All right, Jesus Christ, give me the strength. And then when that happens, you still make a mistake. So then you blame yourself rather than Jesus because you know Jesus is the one giving you strength, but then you feel like you're at fault. Now, am I getting somewhere here? You ever try to make a decision that you try to put your best decision on, but you're so afraid that you're going to make a mistake even if God helps you out? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know about you, okay? I do all the time. Yeah. And then I try to t quote that promise, you know, that God will be the one who gives me the strength. But then the Lord showed me something here which encouraged me. If it's good or bad, even when I do the mistakes... I can still do it then. Why? Because Christ takes these things, turns it to good. Look at Romans 8, 28. <laughs> things, right? Things. Paul says, I can do all things, right? Yes. You forgot what Paul meant. Romans chapter 8, verse 28. How can you forget? And we know that what? All things. Oh. See, I can. See, including these all things. Work together for good to them that what? Love God to them who are the called according to his purpose. See, God's going to take care of it. That's encouraging. So, yes, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me, even when I preach on this pulpit. Why? Because once I do those things, God is going to use those things yes. to work it for good. And in return, I learn from my mistake, and it strengthens me even more in my next preaching. Why? Because I taught you preachers this. You only get better when you learn from your mistakes. There's no such thing as a perfect first sermon. If you did that, you're not going to learn more. You learn better through mistakes. You might say, why is that? Because mistakes, you remember more. Your flesh, your wicked, naughty flesh remembers it even more. All right? But when it gets that compliment and then you go, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The flesh ain't going to be more wary of the areas you need to improve more. All right, let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. So I encourage you men, right? That way you guys can get, uh, keep preaching. But I also try to point out your mistakes. Why? That way you can major on that more. And then it can come out more fine gold when you preach. And your flesh remembers it too. And sometimes I'll remind you of your same problems. Why? Because if the more that your flesh remembers its own problems, the better you can to strengthen yourself to overcome that. And the sermon will be a more strong, more powerful sermon, so to speak. Does this make any sense? Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Weakness is important. Yeah. You can't do a perfect A-plus job. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Notice what Paul says. Look at verse... Uh, 10, therefore I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am what? Weak, Weak then am I what? Strong. Strong. Verse 9, another verse you should memorize. My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength, right? Verse 9, are you reading that? Look at that right there. So in 2 Corinthians 12, 9, strength which strengtheneth me, right? I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens. What strengthens? That weakness you went through based on what Christ and Christ's grace can fall upon you on that. When he gives you that grace, that's why you have the grit with the patience. That's why Paul mentioned this verse right after contentment, you have to understand. They're all tied together, these promises. They're all tied together. Man, this is a wonderful thing. You learning a lot tonight? Amen. Amen. It's okay. I'll learn a lot myself tonight, all right? If I didn't teach this tonight, I wouldn't have learned this much, right? So it's okay, all right? If you don't learn, I'll learn. <laughs> Look back at Philippians 4. Philippians 4. <clears throat> Philippians 4, verse 14. Philippians 4, 14. So it's so important that uh, it's... It's urgent to understand that you can do anything in life, but in order to do that, it's not just I can do anything in life, period. It's I can do anything in life, what? It's all based on Christ. That is extremely important. And then when you think about Christ, well, what if I mess up? Hey, are, you, are your mistakes greater than Jesus Christ? See, Christ is greater than all your mistakes. And do you doubt his promise that I can use those things 
to strengthen you, to hone you better. Amen. Encouraging. Man, I want to park it there, but let me get moving on. Amen. Verse 14. Notwithstanding, ye have well done that ye did communicate with my affliction. So what does that mean? So Paul says notwithstanding. So like nevertheless. Why did he say that? Why did he say like nevertheless? Because returning to the main subject here. Remember verse 10? Verse 10. If you look at verse 10 here, Paul rem Remember, he told the Philippians that at the last, that's when your financial support came. But then he was explaining verse 11, 12, and 13 because he was saying, it's not that because I needed money because I've learned to be content whatever I go through and I can do anything through Christ and that's what strengthens me. See, so there, there's no doubt this is all tied to contentment. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. They're, they're all tied together. They're interchangeable. So because of that, Paul, that's why he's returning back to the subject at hand. So even though uh, I'm content and I can go through without money, guess what? You've done well, actually, in giving me this money that he did communicate with my affliction. Communicate is another word where it means to financially give, to support. So that the Philippians gave financially during his affliction. So notice affliction is in this word. So there's no doubt because he mentioned about my suffering, my affliction, he has that in mind in verse 11, 12, and 13, right? And it's like what I told you, suffering is a part of all this process here, suffering. That's why, does it make more sense why you should thank God for suffering? You might say, why? You'll never learn what it's like to be content. You would go down an endless ditch of I want more. I want more. I want more. It's an empty hole. Right, right. And not only that, you want to learn what it's like to be confident. Confident in the things that you're doing. Why? Because you've had experience with that and the mistakes that you made before. So you're not afraid to go through the mistakes. That's how you get more confident people. Usually people who uh, are more confident, they can do job better. And that's coveted, and they emphasize that in the workplace, but, in order to, uh, but obviously not false confidence, right? You need right confidence. But how you get right confidence is this experience of suffering. Suffering is all a necessary ingredient of everything. Okay, so verse 15, Now ye Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, so Paul says, now you Philippians know you also know, so knowing, so meaning that you also know along with me, so you can agree with what I'm saying here. That what? When the gospel was first preached to them, see the beginning stage when he was giving them the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, that's when he left Macedonia to go to Philippi. No church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving. He said that once he le left Macedonia, Ever since he was with the Philippians, there was no other church that communicated, that was giving uh, to Paul concerning about what? Giving and receiving. That, that doctrine, giving and receiving. That's a wonderful, powerful gift. That's basically offering. But only what? The Philippians. No other church was like that. So they were a giving church. For even Thessalonica, he sent once and again unto my necessity necessity so paul said once again right once more basically when he went to thessalonica the philippians never stopped giving so they sent uh his necessities that he needed they ministered to him so let's look at acts 16 and second corinthians 8 acts 16 and second corinthians 8 and then I'm going to give you probably the only verse in the Bible, that, to my knowledge, the only verse in the Bible, to my knowledge, that every missionary, missionary and preacher should think about. All right? So I'll talk about that one. That one's going to be really interesting. But first, let's discuss these passages. So let's know the background of the Philippian church on what's going on. Let's go to Acts chapter 16. Notice right here, Paul was about to go to... Uh, over at verse 9. 
And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him, saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. See that? So look at verse 10. He was going to Macedonia to preach the gospel, right? But then notice when he departed, he went to another city that's a part of Macedonia, verse 12, and from thence to Philippi. So that's where it happened. That's where the gospel was beginning to be preached. Now go to 2 Corinthians 8, 2 Corinthians 8. So now you know the background of what's going on with his relationship with the Philippians. But 2 Corinthians 8 shows you that Paul realized that the Philippians, they were the ones giving, and he never asked church for money. He said no other church gave except the Philippians. But there was a particular church who was so bad, like extremely bad in giving, and remember, Paul said that no other churches were the ones that really gave to him. It's a Philippian church, right? So we know he's not the type that will beg. But this church, they were, not, uh, they were so bad in giving that they were actually taking more from Paul. And it was really bad. And this is a church you don't want to be. And this is uh, what I want to preach hard in. My favorite epistle to teach on, actually, for the churches is not Philippians, sadly. It should be. You know what it is? First and second Corinthians. Why? You're that type of church. You're that type of church. Every fleshly problem you can think of in the ministry, the best books of the Bible are first and second Corinthians. All right, so let's look at second Corinthians chapter eight. Look at right here. Paul was not pleased. This was pretty, pretty bad. When we look at second Corinthians chapter eight. Eight. Verse 1, moreover, brethren, he's speaking to the Corinthians, we do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of what? Macedonia. He's talking about where the, uh, the Philippians were at, that region in Macedonia, right? How then in a great trial of affliction, in abundance of their joy and their deep poverty, so they were poor people too, but notice, abounded unto the riches of their liberality. So Paul said that they were giving, uh, but you'll notice right here, at verse 7, Therefore, as ye abound in everything, in faith and utterance and knowledge and in all diligence and in your love to us, see that ye abound in this grace also. I speak not by commandment, but by occasion of the forwardness of others and to prove the sincerity of your love. Now, that's the worst statement you can ever hear from a pastor. The worst statement you can ever hear from a pastor is him out of embarrassment, and Paul was embarrassed because he, uh, he was very embarrassed. He said, I speak to your shame and everything, is that he had to uh, tell them to give him money, tell him to give to the ministry. Why? That doesn't make him look good. So then he's saying, I'm not saying this because I'm making you. I'm forcing you, right? I'm not speaking out of commandment, but what? The forwardness of other people. And to prove the sincerity of your love. Why? Because they had a giving problem. They were that bad. And then Paul's like, look, you can prove yourself as a good church by giving. Now that's really bad. You know what? I'll tell you what would make this pastor start to preach to you about giving. It's not when you don't uh, give to me. It's actually when the missionary gets a very small love offering. When we have a lot of people. That's going to make me preach to you and say, look, I'm embarrassed to say this, but because of the foreignness of others and to prove the sincerity of your love, because it showed we mistreated that poor missionary, that, uh, hey, can't you give more? That's the, that's the most shameful thing ever. All right, then. Let's take up a love offering. No, I'm just kidding. All right. <laughs> All right, Philippians chapter 4. Now, I, I am aware of preachers who rob people of their money, all right? So I don't want people to get that kind of impression from me, all right? So I told you before I could care less about your money because the Lord always gives to me, yeah. all right? So, so far I'm being supported, so God's been very good to me. However, the thing is, is that I cannot, uh, because of the problem of uh, preachers who greedily grab money for themselves. That ain't going to make me water down my preaching if you have a problem with giving to the Lord. Yeah. Okay, so I have to cover all wrong areas no matter what. No matter how I look like to some people or people might get the wrong impression of me. Okay, okay, let's go back. Let's go back. Verse 17, now this is something that for me, actually, and for you one day, but for every missionary, all right, especially those greedy pastors, this is their problem. But think about this, 
because sometimes we overlook this if you are a preacher or you've done mission work before. Not because I desire a gift. Now, do you see that? Paul's saying that when you gave money to me, it's not because I wanted that gift of yours, that your monetary gift. But I desire fruit that may abound to your account. Now, I would, uh, I'd highlight that if you're going to be a preacher one day. Paul says uh, it's because when you put money on the plate, it's not because uh, I want the monetary gift. It's because I want you to produce more fruit for the Lord. Now, you know what the tendency is? The tendency, which is not wrong, okay, is that uh, when, you are, when you're a preacher who is a guest speaker for different churches and they give you a huge amount of money, what is it? There's that desire there of that gift and that humility and you're very grateful and you thank them so much about it. But then the problem with that, there is a problem with that, however. The problem with that is, see, we're thinking about ourselves when we receive that. We're thinking about, man, I'm so humbled that I received this. I mean, who am I? Praise the Lord. Well, it's not about you. It's about man. Uh, I want them to get rewards in heaven for giving me this. Amen. I want them to produce more fruit for the Lord for this. If that should be in every missionary letter, that should be a life verse for every missionary in deputation, actually. Wow. So that's very, uh, this is a very important verse. I don't know of any other verse like that that can teach this kind of doctrine, to be honest. But that's what I learned from this verse. That's what I learned from this verse. That's the doctrine that I learned from this verse is that if I were to preach for other churches one day, or I have been, actually, I just don't publicize it that much. But uh, when I preach for a lot of different churches, the first thing that I should be doing when I receive this is uh, when I take it, I mean, there should be humility and gratitude, obviously, but the priority should be, Lord, will you bless this church so much? Yeah. Amen. With a lot of spiritual fruit for what they've done, for what they've done to show their love for you and not for Gene Kim. Praise the Lord. Okay? Yeah. Now, they do love Gene Kim, don't get me wrong, but it's more than that. It's more of how God used Gene Kim. That's why they give a lot, right? So I have to take that and say, Lord, you get the glory for that one. Yes. Will you do something special for this oh, church? God. How many of you missionaries are guilty of not doing that? And even pastors. All right, that, that, that will preach, right? Verse 18, <laughs> verse 18. Ah, 2 Corinthians 8 also taught that. Look at 2 Corinthians 8. There was no doubt when Paul embarrassed the Corinthian church that you need to give, in his heart, he was thinking about, look, I want your fruit to increase, your spiritual fruit to increase. That's the reason why I want you to give. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Same chapter we read before, right? Notice what Paul says right here. So Paul, he had everything in mind at verses 1 through 5, which we read, and through 9, which we read, about their giving. Now we jump to chapter 9. He's continuing the same subject to the Corinthians of giving. Look at chapter 9. Notice in verse 7. This is uh, the favorite verse in offerings today, actually. You'll notice sometimes people posting these verses. Verse 7, every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound towards you, that ye always having all sufficiency in all things may abound to what? Every good work. Every good work. See, your works are building up at the judgment seat of Christ. Amen. Look at uh, verse 9. Your righteousness increases. See that? Look at verse 10. Uh, your fruits are increased. That's what Paul wanted. He wanted them to be a fruitful Christian. All right, go back to Philippians 4. And I'll be very, very honest is that uh, a lot of times I don't get in that habit that I told you about, you know, uh, desiring that their fruits would increase as soon as I receive that monetary gift. However, I do have that for my church where when you give to missions, and not to me. When you give to our blowout uh, speakers, our preachers, our evangelists, and our missionaries, I am so proud of you, and I am so happy, and that is my desire. When you uh, give so much to them, I really mean that. That's my desire. Is your Why? It's good for you. It's a good testimony. 
and how these missionaries and these evangelists would uh, contact me and send me cards and letters thanking our church like they never get this much money before. I'm telling you guys, that's a great testimony of a church that's also wandering too. You know that? That's wandering and in the expensive Bay Area. Yeah. All right, keep giving to the Lord. And I know that some of you sacrificed, okay? I know that. And you know what? I'm so proud of this church. One time uh, I was struggling so much with a very small church and I was afraid and I was embarrassed. I think there was like only four people that day, the missionary. I was incredibly embarrassed. This was a long time ago when I was struggling in my ears. And then I ran to my uh, treasurer. I was like, man, we don't have enough love offering, do we? And he's like, no. Uh, and then it turned out to be six hundred dollars. And I was shocked. I'm like, wait, 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 how do I? And then I was like, well, there are only four people, so I could probably guess who. <laughs> I actually thanked that person. And the person said, I, I just dug inside my pocket, whatever was in there, I just put it in there, Pastor. Wow. Wow. Yeah, so that is a huge blessing, actually. That's a huge blessing. But I'm sure there were a couple others, too. But see, that's a great testimony. Never in my church, this is such a big blessing. You know how happy I am? Never in my church did we give little. Never. Praise the Lord. Man, praise the Lord. I, that's the joy of my heart. Amen. I really mean that. All right, let's go to Philippians 4. Verse 18. We have to wrap this up quickly. Uh, actually, let's see here. Yeah, I have to wrap this up because then it will be too short in the next Philippians study. So let's wrap this up quickly, okay? Let's go on. Verse 18. But I have all. So Paul, again, he says that he has everything that he needs. So he doesn't need the money, obviously. And abound. And I am full. So he increased and he is full. Why? Because of that monetary gift. Having received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you. So Epaphroditus was the one that he received the money, the things that was sent from the Philippians, an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. Now that's very important is that what was sent from the Philippians was to God an odor of a sweet smell. It smelled good. It was a great sacrifice God accepted and it pleased him. You have to realize that you cannot sacrifice the best of your lambs today. But the way you can sacrifice on the altar is you give that money to the Lord. Not just your bodies, but that money to the Lord as well. That, so if you want to know how you can sacrifice to the Lord, it's giving money. Another companion passage you can write down for that one is Hebrews 13. So it'll be Hebrews 13... Uh, verse 16, I'll read it quickly. But to do good and to communicate, see that communicate, forget not, for with such sacrifices God is well pleased. Now let's go to verse 19 of Philippians 4. But my God shall supply all your need. So another wonderful promise that I have to swiftly go through, but try to take time. So Paul says, even though you sacrificed at verse 18, God's going to supply your need. And all of you know that when you sacrificially gave. I can tell you testimonies of people here who sacrificially gave and God just miraculously provided them something that they always prayed for all that time. So God provides, God will supply every need you have according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Why? Because the supplication comes from the piggy bank in heaven above by Jesus Christ. So if God can provide Everything in heaven, do you think that piggy bank's going to run out and it's so much trouble in this piggy bank in heaven to give you something down below? One of the greatest prayer promises is Philippians 4, 19 that you want to claim when you pray. I usually claim that. It is very important. You might say, why is that? Because go to Ephesians 1. Actually, uh, it's not Ephesians. Colossians 1, I think. Colossians, yeah. Let's go to Colossians 1. Hopefully that's the passage. Uh, no, I think, it's, uh, I think it's Corinthians. So let me look at 2 Corinthians 1. Go to 2 Corinthians 1. If that's not it, I'm going to look through my uh, search engine quickly. Let's see if this is it. can't believe I forgot the verse. I think I forgot. All right, so let me find it quickly, okay? I 
totally missed. It's uh, Ephesians 3. Okay, it's Ephesians 3. I apologize. Ephesians chapter 3. We're going to go to Ephesians chapter 3. I apologize for that delay. Ephesians 3 and then verse 20. All right, why is this a precious prayer of promise? Because God's the one who supplies your needs, and it's according to the piggy bank in heaven. But that is based on, obviously, prayer. Prayer, in order to get that need from the Father, you need to ask Him. So flip, Ephesians 3.20 says, Now unto Him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we what? Ask or think or according to the power that worketh in us. See, so when God gives you things, you need to ask Him for it. Now, the combination of Ephesians 3.20 and Philippians 4, here's the deeper truth, which is encouraging, is that I quote that verse. I said, Lord, you promised this, so you need to provide the need. Here are two things you can learn. One is your need will definitely be provided. Why? Because it's coming from a piggy bank called heaven. And it's not going to run out. It's not too hard. As a matter of fact, it's beyond even what you can even ask for in prayer. So that's the amazing thing. And even better than that, it's even better than what you ask for in prayer. God's not going to provide your need that's above your prayer. It's going to be even beyond your imagination. Why? Because it says in Ephesians 3, above all that we ask or think. Now, there's a second promise to this. The second promise is, notice it says, my God shall supply not your greed, but your need. Not your desire, but your need. You might say, why is that good? Because if you need money, God will give you money. If you need loss of money, God will give you loss of money. If you need relief and healing, God will give you relief and healing. If you need pain and sacrifice, God will give you pain and sacrifice. If you need comfort and encouragement, God will give you comfort and encouragement. If you need trial and patience and misery, God will give you trial misery. And that's something to shout about. Daniel, Brother Daniel Price, he, you might recall, he read that Ruckman's commentary on that one. That's, ex that's the second thing you should be shouting about when God provides your needs. If he gave you everything you wanted, then you will never be happy. And it will truly not be the riches from heaven. Because God knows exactly what you really need. And then the need can conflict the desire. If you go by your desire, you're going to live truly a miserable life. That's but if true. God goes by what you exactly need, he's going to go above what you ask or think. Amen. Because you can't understand Whoa, pain. That's our and when you pray and cry and you ask him to deliver you from that cancer, it's going to be above all that you ask or think. And Whoa. God's like, no, let's use your cancer to lead that doctor and that nurse oh, to yeah. Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, let's go back to Philippians 4, and I have to rush. I, I want to park it there. <laughs> Got to rush, okay? All right, verse 20, let's wrap it up. Now unto God and our Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. So Paul wants to give glory to God, and he deserves a glory that lasts forever. And you, all God's people said in that one, amen. amen. Now, this is an important verse to disprove Jehovah Witness or stupid James White and the modern Bible translators. Yes. You'll notice right here it says God and our Father, right? All right. Now, the, notice that this is an example of a Hendiatus. And basically what that is is that obviously Jehovah Witnesses are going to agree that the Father is God. Well, look at right here at verse 20, God and our Father. Yeah. That doesn't mean it's separated, right? It means that God is in line with the Father. Well, then why do they have a problem with this one? Titus 2, verse 13. So just write it down, Titus 2, 13. The glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. So that proves Jesus is God. Yeah. But according to Judas White and then Jehovah Witnesses, White follows along with JWs for some weird reason. Why? Because they have the same initials, JW. They both have the same initials. All right, so then these guys say, there's an error in the King James Bible. So it disproved the deity of Jesus Christ, says JW. And he says that, oh, you just ruined the precious promise. And no, you just don't know basic English or even basic Greek itself. Right. All right, let's go back to Philippians 4. 
He didn't read Philippians 4.20. No, he skipped Philippians because he probably didn't read his Bible every day. And he just skipped to Titus and found an error, supposedly, in the King James Bible. But if he read his Bible every day, he would have caught that one. Yeah. All right, anyways. Verse 21, salute every saint in Christ Jesus. So Paul is giving salutations. He's saying, uh, every saint that is uh, saved in Jesus Christ, I give my salutations and make sure that you give them my salutations. Salute them for me. The brethren which are with me greet you. Paul says, everyone who is with me. Uh, also give their greetings to you. All the saints salute you, chiefly they that are of Caesar's household. So notice that Paul said that all the saints uh, are giving their salutations to you, especially prominently those who are in the royal household of Caesar himself, a Roman pagan emperor. So here's the thing is that uh, I believe that elitists are evil uh, and I don't really trust them as far as I kick my left foot, but that don't mean that they're incapable of salvation. Yes. There are people that can be uh, that are saved Christians in there can be saved Christians in NASA, in the White House and in CDC and in all these places. Now, as much as you hate to do that, sometimes you have to ask yourself this. Do you really love these souls then, or do you hate people? See, no, I love people. Then why do you uh, get upset when the Bible shows that these kind of people are capable of salvation? Yeah. Is, it, do you not want them to be saved? That's why you get upset about that? Sometimes you have to ask yourself that one, right? All right, so uh, verse 20 through 21-22 uh, is a good passage of pastor's attitude. Every pastor's attitude should be where they should keep track of people and greet them, make sure that they are greeted and saluted and let them know that you're here for them. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. So that's Paul's closing that you saw in uh, that you saw in Ephesians, that you saw in Galatians, that you saw in all the previous epistles before. He always closes that way. God's grace go with all of you and all of God's people said, Amen. And you just said Amen over there. All right. Let's close with a word of prayer. I pray that tonight's teaching has been very helpful to the hearers, Heavenly Father, and may we stand upon these precious promises as that hymn says, I'm standing on the promises of God. Help us to claim it. We have it, Father. We just don't claim it. We just don't use it, Father. And I pray that this will be very helpful and beneficial to our lives. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.